there, so. Good morning. Uh, it is 9.02. It is Wednesday, October 10th, doing scheduled hearing of the Community Preservation Committee on Nantucket. Okay. There are five members present, so we have a quorum. Uh, and we have our first uh, applicant to do a presentation uh, to us. This uh, session is being recorded. Uh, and uh, you've been here before, uh, Jason, uh, but introduce yourself and uh, take about five or ten minutes to sort of flesh out the uh, application and then uh, we'll open up the question for the commission. Oh. Um, my name is Jason Leonardo Finger, and I am a um, trustee of the Coffin School on Winter Street. Um, I've been a trustee for probably about 10 years, give or take a little bit. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a wonderful group of people. Um, and our mission um, is to, um, part of our mission is to preserve the historic Coffin School. It was built in 1852, originally founded in about 1827 by um, the Admiral um, Isaac Coffin. Um, and um, another part of our mission is also to support um, groups of um, children on the island, including um, graduating seniors and those who are already in um, college. Um, that is part of our mission is to help um, with some small scholarships. Um, of course, we don't have a large um, endowment, so that is the reason why we are here today. Um, so what we've been doing over the last few years um, is a um, phased um, conservation of the exterior of the Coffin School. Um, and the Community Preservation Act um, and committee have been incredibly generous to us and allowed us to do, if you have not seen it, um, the whole um, facade of the building has now been conserved. Um, the pediment has been on the outside rebuilt. Um, the front of the building, this, the, the um, stone pieces around the front have actually been removed. Um, drainage has been put in because the building was starting to sink at the front um, and everything's been put back. You can't tell that Wayne Morris, the um, mason who worked on the building, was even there. Um, and the columns have been um, refurbished and painted. Um, and we've also worked on one um, chimney that was um, about ready to fall down. So that has been um, rebuilt. Um, and we're also working on our uh, wrought iron fence. Um, the fence was um, a joint ask that I did with the Prospect Hill Cemetery, the Mariah Mitchell Association, and the Coffin School trustees um, to work on three wrought iron fences. Um, the Mitchell, House, Mitchell family plot at Prospect Hill has now been restored. It's back in place. It looks fantastic. You can see it from um, Milk Street Extension as you drive up past the MMA's um, Wines Observatory. And currently, um, DeAngelis Ironwork who did that fence is also working on the replacement pieces to the coffin school fence. So that's why the coffin school fence is still down. They will come back, replace the pieces, replace the bars that hold it in place, um, and we will repaint the fence. And that was community preservation committee funded as well. Um, so we've come back to you um, to ask for the final phase of the exterior of the building. This would be to work on the two sides of the building, if you're staring straight ahead at the building, and the rear part of the building. Um, and this is to replace um, it, with like kind, we have uh, Wayne Morris has stockpiled um, some historic bricks that match our building and mortar that he's already matched to the front because there's a lot of spalling and cracking and, and loss of bricks that's going on around on all the details that go around the building, um, which is one, not good for the building, but um, from its historic standpoint, but also is not good for the building for um, safety of people. Um, and what's happened is it's you know, frozen and, and popped over time. So we're um, asking for around a little over $100,000 to, to do those three sides. And once those three sides are completed, um, the exterior of the coffin school will have been stabilized. Um, and then we'll be able to turn our focus to doing some more work that we would like to do on the inside. And then our hope is to once particularly the exterior is stabilized to reopen the school as far as letting groups on island use it. Um, the main room, we used to have different groups like um, the Community Music Center and what have you have concerts in there because it's a really lovely space for that and also the sound is fantastic. Um, so we'd like to be able to do that again. So that is what we are asking for so that we can do the conservation of the remaining exterior of the building. Questions from the commissioners? Um, just in general, does um, 
I've used Mr. Morris before. Does he give you a sense of how hourly rate? I mean, he just gave you kind of a lump sum. I know he's got the staging broken down. In, I have worked in, I've worked with Wayne Morris um, on numerous projects at MMA, Coffin School, um, and I have found him to be, um, when he provides the estimate, I would say 99% of the time his estimate can come in lower, but he doesn't know what he's going to Encounter. Yes, yeah. exactly. So he does give a lump. If you, I could, I can ask him to do a breakdown hourly, but that's not the way he I've ever had. He's yeah. ever done estimates okay. for us. Um, he is. I will have to say too. He is quite reasonable okay. as far as his um, as far as what he charges. And just so that you know, usually with the contingency funding, we usually don't. Take that, you know, we usually pull that out mm -hmm. just so you know. Um, and I'm glad it's the final phase. Um, and that building is great. And I assume, because I don't know anything about um, the supervision, you know, the $8,000 is probably just a flat fee. He has to make time to time, it's got to come to the island. and Exactly. It's kind of, he's on, it's almost like he's on call. Um, All right. It could be that we don't really need him, but there have been times that Wayne has uncovered something that we need to talk to him either. Um, uh, I, I introduced Wayne Morris to FaceTime. It's not his favorite thing, but um, it does help quite a bit. <laughs> and it actually has saved John Watney from actually coming down here, the structural mm -hmm. engineer, because he can see things real time as if he's here, which has been fantastic. And, and John's been very receptive to doing that. And also taking videos rather than photographs has helped a lot. So it's, it's it, you know, my hope is that we won't really need John that much. But again, there might be something that Wayne's taking apart and opens a can of worms, which is has occurred, even though the engineering has been done to look at the building and assessed. You just don't know until you start pulling things apart what might lie underneath. And the only other question is that you really don't have too many other funding sources. You don't have like, you know, you, can, you don't qualify for like other not, not really. Um, I had applied to one other other group and that we didn't really qualify for. I have to say, um, as my life is in historic preservation, um, in large part, historic preservation, for lack of a better word at the moment, tends to not be very sexy. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's really, you are one of the few on island who will fund it. Um, and it's there's other layers. Uh, we already have a preservation easement, but there's other layers of things that I would have to go to in order to apply for other funding from from away. So um, I, to be quite frank with you, the Community Preservation Committee has really been the most helpful to us. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, following up on Maria's question, which sort of dovetail, dovetails with what I was going to ask, is have you had any other quotes for the masonry? To be, I have worked with other masons on the island. Um, but I will, uh, again, I'll be frank, based on my um, experiences, um, I use one other mason for other work, and that's Penn Austin. Mm -hmm. um, but this kind of work that is being done is not necessarily what Penn wants to do nor likes to do, and that is the reason why um, we've been using Wayne, um, which is, a, you know, that will also dovetail into when I talk about Mariah Mitchell. Um, he, he has... I have 40 plus years of experience. He knows how to think outside the box. He works really well with the structural engineer. He and I work really well together. Um, and I really trust um, his knowledge and his experience and what he does. I mean, he's been, you know, at the MMA Science Library, he took a 1930 stucco wing and it was it was a little bit terrifying, but he was able to pull out all of the um, the ironwork and replace it with steel, where it was all oxide jacking. And it was a it was that was one of the times that we needed John Watney, like literally had to be like hanging out near his phone to make sure he was there. And he did a superb job. And I just really think he's really the best on the island. I shudder to think when he retires, um, because we've really relied on him at both. You know, he's done, I mean, St. Paul's, he's done the, the Mason's Lodge, um, you name it. Wayne is there. You might not know he's been there, but he's been there. So. Thank you. Other questions? Jason, um, part of the thing that, that we really like to do is to uh, have the organization sort of uh, themselves pitch in Mm -hmm. With respect to some cost, mm -hmm. um, and I, I I hear you saying because we've been your piggy bank, mm -hmm. uh, so, and I haven't seen much activity in terms of on your own part mm -hmm. in terms of trying to generate funds to do some of this. Um, so, 
accepting the fact that, that, that it's not easy for you to do, it leads to my concern as to whether or not there's going to be sufficient funding and reserve to be able to make sure that the work that we do doesn't uh, be, become repeated mm -hmm. uh, for lack of maintenance mm -hmm. and lack of care. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see anything in the financials with respect to sort of a reserve set up for the maintenance of the building on an ongoing basis. The Coffin School trustees have a small endowment from which we are required to, as I said earlier, um, pay out small scholarships. The Coffin School trustees have paid um, a good portion uh, towards other, like the assessment that we did originally with John Watney. Um, I can't remember the exact price off the top of my head, but it was in the tune of probably eight to twelve thousand dollars. That came out of the Coffin School trust, trust Coffin School's own pocket. So there are there are expenses that the Coffin School has been paying around some of this, some of the painting and all that kind of stuff that we can that we have enough money that we can afford to put towards it. Um, I have applied to things like Tuppence Harris. Um, which kind of we, there was a little bit of a, I don't remember exactly what happened, but we didn't really um, fit the bill necessarily. It's not for lack of trying um, on our part. It's just for having, um, like I said, it's difficult to find monies um, for historic preservation. But we do have monies in our, in our accounts that we, we will continue to do things that we already do around the building. Mm -hmm. The work that we're doing to the building, nothing, well, I, I'll say, take it back, it's probably in the 1950s or 1960s is when they had done some work to that pediment, and they did a really, really horrible job. And what they did was they used, as everyone did at that time, Portland cement instead of the lime mortar. Mm -hmm. So the hope and belief is that the work that we're doing will keep this building stable for the next 100 years. It's not anything that's going to require any kind of um, repeated work to it, because we're actually reintroducing the appropriate materials rather than the wrong materials. And to be quite frank with you, because it was a school for the manual trades, um, into the 60s, there were some students who would do work under the guise of their teachers to the school. So like our fence, for example, has like really, no offense to anyone, poorly made replacement parts that were made in the metal smithing class that was downstairs in the basement. Um, and while they held up fantastically for the last 50 or so years, they need to go away and be replaced appropriately. So we are, tr I, I, we are trying, and I think this is basically um, the last phase of the project. So we don't expect to come back to the Community Preservation Committee. Well, the, your, the, the, the application says that this is to <coughs> repair the two sides in the rear. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible that, that does Wayne have to do all this all at once, or can it be stayed to, if our funding is, is limited? And if so, uh, uh, how, would that, how, how would that work? Um, Ideally, it would all be done in one fell swoop only because each time he does a side, he has to bring staging in from off island. He can't use his own kind of staging. It has to be a sear. I don't know if you ever saw the when the front was being done. It was fully staged with special ladders and everything. Um, and every time the people come from off island to do it, they charge more money. So mm -hmm. the belief was that if we could just go side, back, side, we could just keep moving the staging, and it wouldn't be that they took all the staging down, took it back off island, then brought it back on island, put it back up. It makes it go up by thousands of dollars. So that's why we were asking to try and do the rest of this all in one fell swoop. But if we had to, we have to. It would just mean that it's going to be more money in the end. Other questions? Well, that's, that is a good question. So I, I didn't see that staging was actually it's part of it's Wayne's estimate. I, I understand, but um, how I think it would be a help to us if the staging was broken out, yeah, um, so that we get a feel of how much extra it would be adding if we didn't have enough funds. Um, I mean, I think we all take your point about how it's obviously a more cost-effective to do it all at once. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you still try to rent that building out during the summer? Or so we, we have the community um, sailing is in the basement, and the community preservation committee is yeah. in the um, right. home ec yeah. room. 
And then um, our hope is that at some once the exterior is fully completed, um, we could start allowing groups to come back in and use like the front part for like concerts and other meetings because right. like we had the um, film festival had been using it and and all sorts of other groups. So the hope is that we can reopen it again. And we've already started talking about that, um, but we don't want and we've had people who keep asking us, but we're just afraid for safety's purpose, especially for that front of the building before the facade was completed. Yeah. That like a brick was going to spall off and hit somebody, so we didn't want to run that risk. And and can those funds be used in your budget? I mean, can you? They can. They don't cover. Um, we don't charge a lot for our rent, so um, basically the rent covers um, basically the heating and electricity and, and whatever the tenants you know are not paying and the mowing and the trees and what have you. It doesn't bring in uh, much. No, and we, and the other thing is is in renting those those spaces, we don't want to overcharge people because we want to we're a nonprofit as well and we understand everyone else so we want to make it as accessible as possible yeah. so it's not a lot it wouldn't be a lot of money that would be brought in for you know, you know in the past the main hall could be rented for I believe and this was when Egan Maritime was also inhabiting the building for like $250 so it wasn't some huge amount of money okay. so I'm sorry go ahead. no go ahead okay well, it does bring up, you know, I know that weddings are sort of a, becoming a major industry there, and I imagine that you certainly charge more than 250 for a wedding for capital campaigns. I mean, since you are such a critical part of um, you know, the fabric of public life. Um, there's a few things within the, in the parameters of how we are, how we can raise money and how we can't raise money. Um, the trustees would prefer not to make the coffin school into a wedding venue. Um, one, it's not very, it's not accessible as far as parking, um, and I don't think the neighbors would be terribly pleased with us. Um, so we're trying to be as as unobtrusive as possible. We're also a volunteer board of about eight people, um, so all this, um, you know, this application is done on my volunteer time. Um, and so all of us are volunteering our time. Tom Montgomery is kind of the building czar, and, and he volunteers his time. Um, and so it makes it more difficult. And um, so we have, and I'd say about half of the people on our board are retirees as well, so some of them travel a lot. But, um, you know, we have thought about different ways, but it's just not, it, ha it hasn't been how the Coffin School has operated, at least in the last, you know, since the, 1940s or something like that when they still had the Coffin School Association and it was an active school. Again, as a nonprofit, we also don't want to, we can't bring in a lot of money because that's going to send off alarm bells as a, as a nonprofit. Right. Yeah, I went to that school. I graduated. <laughs> I knew that was going to come up. <laughs> I had friends when I used to work for Egan Maritime because we were in the basement then who would come over to where my desk was and and, and they would be like, oh, this is this is where we had nap. This is where I get sleepy because they went to kindergarten. And so that was where my desk was. was in the nap time area. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, our co our president did it there as well. Yeah. So, just. As a matter of reference, on page 51 here, which is in section seven, there, when I look at that, it does tell me what, you, what it's going to boil down to in terms of setting up two different times. And it looks like there's a four thousand dollar differential that he quotes out at this okay. point. So understanding that for the rest of the project, I think would be good. Okay. Um, we've got like five million dollars worth of request, and yeah. frankly, we're if we see two, two. Okay. that'll be amazing. So yeah, the, the belt is getting a lot tighter. Mm -hmm. um, so getting back to us with that would be a really good thing. I think okay. we set a deadline of October 18th, was yeah. it? Yeah. October yeah. letter? October 18th. 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 Yeah. Um, subsequently as well, the, the other two things I'd like to know is um, maybe just a little breakdown about what you, the organization has done in terms of assisting with the building, mm -hmm. um, just over the course of the past few years. And the other thing that really concerns me is, you said, do you have a building maintenance fund? 
it's part of just our we have a piggy bank and that's what we all right yes. because here's here's why i'm gonna kind of want to get into that a little further um you know i realistically we've spent a fairly good amount of money from the cpc to get this building taken mm -hmm. care of at this point and i think one of the things we're always concerned with as well too is what's the ongoing process mm -hmm. we may not be here one day but boy do we want to see that memorialized later mm -hmm. as opposed to all of a sudden it's like, wow. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I, I'd just like to get a better sense of that somehow from you. So what, what would you like me to uh, just Just to get a sense of what it is that you're planning for building maintenance into that. the future um, or what you already have available for resources. I mean, I'm really looking at the future of, you know, this project well beyond our day and time here. And know that the building, the in both interior and exterior, really are, are, are being thought of for the future, mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. things do happen outside of this, you know, outside of what we do. That mm -hmm. there's at least some sense of it's being mm -hmm. in good solid hands. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. And do you want me to send this in a letter to Glenna or? Yes. Her? Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Can the, may I email it? Yes. Okay. Linda. The one thing I wrote down when I went through it really has nothing to do with this particular application, but every time I walk past that fence, did that come up earlier? The fence is being restored. She's okay, yeah, that because before. that's been three years since no, I gave them the Yes, well, there, has been, there was, um, because of all of the issues with um, with iron and all that, D'Angelo's Iron Group, who, are, who we've been working with that's outside Boston, um, is actually one of the best. They have a lot of issues with sourcing um, the metals that they needed um, and also sourcing them within the price that they had originally quoted me. Um, because I said to them, that's all the money we have, so you can't go over it. So that's part of it. Um, and also fabricating it. So the Mitchell family plot at the cemetery is completed. It's up. Yeah. Um, and they were hoping to come back um, later this fall or early this spring and put the fence back up. But they have to replace all the bars that hold the fence in place all have to be replaced, and that's what they're working on. And then they're also repla replacing the broken, um, replacing, refabricating the broken or um, student-made pieces that go around. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's quite a bit of an undertaking. I just want to make sure that was going to continue. Yeah. Oh, no, no it's, yeah, yeah, yeah we did. It's it, half of it's it basically half. Because we had it's multiple done. projects under that one. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Cool. Uh, this is not really a uh, topic, except that <clears throat> with respect to handicapped accessibility, mm -hmm. we have living proof here that the uh, walkway is not uh, very yes. uh, <clears throat> handicapped uh, friendly mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering what the plans are with respect to that. We have been talking about that step that goes up on that side where the ramp is. We've been talking about how to um, in a historically appropriate way lower it and maybe make it into a ramp so it is something that's part of the discussion that we've been having. A brick ramp? Just a yeah, just a little one so it just looks like right from the sidewalk so the step yeah. would be removed and the, it would be just like a little ramp up. that would go up. Yeah. Yes, we're fully aware of that. We did what have about, a little piece of the going way back because those are really very unruly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The walkway. You mean right. the brick walkway? The brick yeah. Um, we, well, we obviously need to address that as well. Um, but that would be something that would be, um, you know, part of our kind of landscape um, discussion. We only meet about six times a year, and again, we're a volunteer organization. So, um, the, the, but I, I, I can say that it is something that we have discussed ad nauseum. It's just that we have to actually. Well, do I, it. I'd like to, as a tenant, mm -hmm. like to put it at the top of your list because. The way that it is right now does not allow us to use the space for our meeting mm -hmm. because it's not appropriately mm -hmm. accessible. Mm -hmm. and so it ends up having us having to go search and be all over mm -hmm. with respect to meetings. So it's, it's very important from our point of view mm -hmm. as a tenant so that, that the handicap accessibility mm -hmm. would be improved. Oh, we're fully aware we have at least one or two people on our board who have accessibility issues, so we have to help them in and out. So, yes, we're aware of that. We have yes. to have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. Wow. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Any other questions? Then you have a clear understanding of what we're looking at. Yes, you want um, me to get, uh, see if I can get, probably get Wayne to give me a, what the staging price would be, and then also talk to you a little bit about what our resources are for our building and what our thoughts are concerning maintenance going forward for the building. Is there anything else that anyone else wants? 
Thank no, I, you. I can just vouch for the people that they're working with only because he did the Legion and he did a spectacular job on the Legion. So mm -hmm. he yeah. used the right lime mortar, he used to call that cement out. It was great. Yeah. He's, really, he's really great. He's still not me, though. <laughs> no, no. Right. Thanks, thanks okay. Thanks, very thanks, much. You're welcome. I'm still here. You're still here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You're going to get to go away. Yeah. Different half. Okay. Oh, that's right. Yes. <laughs> Is it just you for uh, Mitchell as well? It's good thing we can beat you up. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm pretty sure. Okay, it is 9.30, 9.29, and uh, let's proceed then with the same format with uh, an introduction to Brian Mitchell. Uh, that's all right. It's me. No, sorry. Okay. There we go. Thanks, Barry. You want to say how many times Okay, well, my name is Jason Leonardo Finger, and I am the Mariah Mitchell Association's Deputy Director and the Curator of the Mitchell House Archives and Special Collections at the MMA, which I have worked for for over 30 years. Um, in my capacity, both as curator um, and also as Deputy Director over the last several years, um, part of my um, charge at the Mariah Mitchell Association is oversight and working on the conservation um, and maintenance of all of our facilities. So um, from exploding toilets to historic preservation. Um, and um, we have over the last, actually almost since the inception of the Community Preservation Act and committee um, have sought funding in small pockets for the association. Um, one of our largest projects, which was fully funded by the CPC happily, was the exterior conservation of our science library at 2 Vestal Street, which I'm happy to say that we opened to the public in May after a very lengthy and extensive conservation um, for the exterior and the interior of the building. The Community Preservation Act funded the exterior work to the building, which is a circa 1830s um, wood structure that was Mariah Mitchell's father's schoolhouse and then the 1933 stucco portion, um, which was added to be a fireproof um, building for the um, archives and special collections for the Mariah Mitchell Association, um, which today now houses all of our natural science collections thanks to the Community Preservation Committee's funding. Um, we were able to work with John Watney, the structural engineer um, who, um, of Structures North, um, Wayne Morris and several other people. Wayne Morris's um, job on the library building um, for, the, for the stucco portion was the lion's share of the um, funding from the Community Preservation Committee. It required removing all of the, um, the, the metal or iron lintels that were rusting and causing all kinds of oxide jacking so that the building was kind of starting to pop and grow, quote unquote, in places. Um, and to re, re to bring to take those out and to put in steel, um, and then to match the stucco as best he could um, to remedy any other um, water issues, and then um, to attack a large area that that we thought was just some map cracking on the back of the building that actually turned out to be that the terracotta tile system that makes the stucco wing um, was actually. Um, had pieces that had crumbled and um, there was like one little part that was holding up the back corner of the building. It was quite terrifying. Um, that was one of the cases in which Wayne was able to think outside the box um, and um, talk with John Watney and get his seal of approval. Um, so Wayne basically helped us save that building, which um, some people don't find attractive, but is actually very rare for Nantucket because it's one of only like four stucco um, buildings on the island. Um, but also that Natco system of terracotta tiles that makes it um, was introduced in the 1920s and there are very few buildings of its kind left in North America. So it's very unusual. So the reason why I'm here today is to ask um, the Community Preservation Committee to consider supporting the Mariah Mitchell Association in its bid for conservation of the historic Vestal Street Observatory, which is the 1908 portion under the dome, and then the 1922 astronomical study. Um, we'd like to do this ideally in two phases, the exterior and the interior. We are working with Nantucket Preservation Trust on a preservation easement. It is in process as we speak. Um, the 1908 observatory was um, the first structure that the Mariah Mitchell Association, which was founded in 1902, um, built. Um, and it, our astronomy department and the building of the observatory came with um, 
financial and um, let's say, I guess I'd say mental help um, from actually Harvard College Observatory. Pickering and Annie Jump Cannon, um, who were very well-known astronomers, helped us develop that. And then in 1922, in a need to expand, we built um, what is kind of the castle-like um, astronomical study that has a little parapet on top. And the building has not um, been worked on, at least the brickwork and the masonry work, pretty much since it was built. <laughs> um, and it is um, in desperate need of um, attention. The masonry work that we need to do will make the build, and the copper work that we need to do to the roof will make the building weather tight. I can attest that as it being the winter site of my office um, over in another addition, I sit at my desk during nor'easters and other rainstorms and I can hear the building dripping. Um, so we have buckets out everywhere to catch those drips. Um, it's not for a lack of not doing maintenance, it's just to the point now that um, as with our stucco wing of our library, um, all of this, the lintels, iron lintels need to be replaced. If it, it's, I don't know if it's, it's apparent in some of the photographs, um, mm -hmm. but there are places where the building has been um, shifting because of that oxide jacking. You can see large areas of cracking, step cracking that's occurring. Um, there's images of leaks that have occurred in different places. There's images on page 25 of um, the basement windows where you can see the oxide jacking that's occurring. So the the, the Iron is rusting and popping and causing the um, masonry and the grout um, or mortar to shift. Um, so there are large areas of cracks. And then there's also the areas of the parapet walls on the um, front of the building where um, the, on page 27, that you can see where the oxide jacking has occurred because of the rusting. And what it's also doing is tipping the parapet walls in different directions. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is also causing, as I said, leaks inside in various places um, in the building. Um, as you can see on page 31, which is inside our dome where we have buckets and glass catching water, but you can also see a large crack that has occurred. Um, so we are looking for assistance and being able to fund um, the preservation work that will occur. This again is something that um, we have asked Wayne Morris to do. Um, because of his experience, work, his vast experience, but also his experience already basically doing this on our on our um, library building, um, and then also continuing to work with the structural engineer. I will say that the Mariah Mitchell Association has already paid the structural engineer for all of the assessments that have led to this, mm -hmm. um, as well as other assessments and meeting with other people on site um, to figure out exactly what what we need to do. We would ideally, as I said, like to do it in two phases: the exterior and the interior because we can't start to work on the interior until the exterior is completely um, weather tight. And that re requires removing pretty much all of the iron lintels and replacing them with steel all around the building from the basements to the main windows to rebuilding the parapet to doing some of the copper work to the dome to alleviate the issues of leaking. Um, we have tried um, uh, you know, the preservation first aid band-aid on the copper of the dome, which is the original copper, um, by going around and um, <laughs> the carpenters lying with with um, like my glasses and figuring out where all the pin, it's literally pinholes, and filling them with silicone to help get us through um, because we just don't have the money to do the repair work. But now it's to the point that we can't do kind of this first aid of preservation. We need to actually do the real work. I've got a couple of questions. Um, it isn't for lack of trying since the building was built that the maintenance hasn't been able to carry. We've done it's, things it's over time. Everything that this building is and how it's constructed, that's just beyond belief. It, it's, you know, you can do maintenance, but now it's to the point, it, it, it's conservation. It's not, it's not filling holes or filling cracks or things. Mm -hmm. It literally is t chiseling out grout you know, putting back in the appropriate grout, because that's another thing when they did repairs, you know, in the 40s and the 50s, again, they used Portland cement. They, they, they thought it was the right thing to do. It was the new thing to use. And the Portland cement, you know, they just don't, they don't work together. Mm -hmm. Now, the other question is, because we have such limited funding, as you already mm -hmm. heard, this seems, some of these projects, I think almost all the projects up to now had priorities mm -hmm. where they could just do this part and come back next year for that mm -hmm. part. Looking at this particular project, it doesn't seem like there's anything we can do this year and, not, and hold off till next year. This seems like an all or nothing type of project. You got to do it all 
It pretty much is because if you want to do anything to the, you can't do anything to the inside of the building until you work on the outside mm -hmm. of the building. And so if you decide, okay, we'll do the front, that's one year. Then you do, then you can't do anything to the inside no the building. Side, then you have to year. do the back. So then you might have re remedied the leaks on the front side that are associated with the front side of the building, but you haven't remedied the leaks that are on associated with the back side of the building. So I could tell you some leaks would stop and I would hear not hear any more leaks on part of the building, but I will still hear drips Some on the other else. side of the building. Because at, at the Legion, we were able to do the east wall, then the north wall, mm -hmm. and now they're doing the west mm -hmm. wall. And as I said, almost all of these had, we'll do this side, then we'll do mm -hmm. that side. But this seems like we need to do it all at one mm -hmm. time. It, 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 not just basically for the economy of scale on the price. Mm -hmm. It just seems like you need to fix it all at one time. We do. Okay. It would be ideal the way, the way to do it, yes. Okay. Well, Jason, you, you may not be the person I should be asking these questions no. to, but in, in part eight of your 990 or page 84. Yeah, I'm probably not the person to ask. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I, it says for fundraising events, you got a revenue of 134000 roughly. And then on part nine, on the next page, mm -hmm. your total for fundraising expenses is 245000 and And also on the statement of functional expenses, You've got bad debt of mm -hmm. four hundred and eighty-five thousand. I'm going to roughly answer that, and I think I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, we do that could be related to. Um, there's a couple of things that it could be related to. One, and and again, I should know this because I'm the daughter of a CPA, but I don't. That's why I'm in museums. Um, the uh, we have um, one of our employees, our astronomer. Um, the MMA has helped with this, uh, her purchase a home, and that gets kind of um, the longer she's, you know, some of the money gets. So she paid part of it. The MMA part pays part of it, and I think what happens because I'm not supposed to be really privy to most of these things um, is that she, um, for each year that she stays, she gets forgiven. I know that also mm -hmm. we have a house that will is. Um, will come to the MMA when the current owner passes away, and I think it might be related to that. We also had, at one point, we did have um, a promise of uh, a, a donation that didn't come to fruition in the year that it was supposed to come to. So it's coming to fruition this year because the person just never did anything about it. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what we're talking about with the quote unquote bad debt. Um, and I do know that our major fundraiser is our soiree, um, which brings in roughly about that amount that you first quoted. And then the other kind of donations would be other donations to the organization, such as, um, you know, uh, uh, general donations um, and other small events that we might have. But I will say that we, we do have an endowment, but the MMA does have to dip into its endowment in order to meet all of its um, needs on a yearly basis. Well, I, I wonder if you could provide us with some additional information on those. OK. So, um, so you want info on the? Yeah, on the, the fundraising expenses, how they you know, exceed their fundraising events significantly and um, on the bad debt. Uh, you know, um, what is it? Yeah. It, I'm also you're, gonna you're coming to us yeah. you know, asking for money while you've got these sort of so working on the sidelines. Fundraising events, fundraising mm -hmm. expenses versus fundraising. Do you have a mortgage on that door? I don't think anybody's disputing that, you know. Mm -hmm. What the building needs. Fundraising versus fundraising events. I think also fundraising expenses also includes things like um, advertising, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, and uh, they're in there, 30,000, mm -hmm. you know, in column D. So those are all broken in there. Um, it, it just seems to exceed. You know what you bring in mm -hmm. by a significant amount, by a hundred thousand dollars, and which, <coughs> and I'm not a CPA, so I'm mm -hmm. missing something right. obvious here. <clears throat> yeah, the, I, as, as deputy director, I, that that part of that doesn't not something that right. is part mm -hmm. of my. And then Mr. Gagnon wasn't available. Mm -hmm. David Gagnon. David Gagnon, yes. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, I guess because I wasn't on CPC in the years that you were granted substantial funding. So what did that, what, in general, what did those? The, for the, so we have received funding for the library, which I talked about, mm -hmm. and we have received funding for um, the Mitchell House Archives and Special Collections. And that includes also, well, it went under the Coffin School, that includes the wrought iron fence restoration. The Mitchell House, the work at the Mitchell House over a period of several years included the conservation of the 1850s grain painting in the house in the 1825 kitchen, other decorative paint in the house, uh, a structural assessment of the building, a climate assessment of the building, which was a year-long study, um, and um, other small conservation projects that have occurred in the Mitchell House or the with the collection. Yeah. Moon paintings. Yeah, the peep at the moon stencil. Yeah. Yeah, the decorative painting in the 1825 kitchen is um, um, basically the, the last example of its kind left in North America to the extent it is. There is other little bits of it on island, but not to the extent that the Mitchell House has it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's unusual. It, and the only other thing is, um, because our funding is going to be really tight this year, the breakdown is, you know, what could you, if you got this amount of money, could you do X, Y, and Z? I and mean, you know, right away I'd probably say, well, the contingency funds is out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but I don't want to strap your project, because I don't really know what you see it's done. So if you could kind of give us an mm -hmm. idea of, you know, if you get us so much money, we could do. Okay, so my question takes a different form. In the early years, when, when we funded uh, um, Maria, Ma Maria Mitchell, 100%, uh, mm -hmm. we were much more flush yes. with funds. Uh, and so, as a result, uh, in the early years, Maria Mitchell contributed nothing towards the conservation and restoration. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I am just wondering, uh, with respect to uh, Ian's point relative to fundraising, um, if there isn't something that in of this total that Ryan Mitchell can take on themselves in terms of making a contribution so that, that between contribution that they could make and what we would give, mm -hmm. that we could provide the funding for the total amount. Because um, what we've tried to do over the last number of years is to, in fact, um, go to organizations and say that we can't be your piggy bank. Mm -hmm. You've got to be a mm -hmm. contributor as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as a result, We've expended the extended significantly the role of the CPC funds mm -hmm. in terms of achieving the mm -hmm. goals under the Act. Mm -hmm. And so I am I'm wondering if uh, you take, can take a look at that and come back to us as a part of the answer to Maria's question as to as to either both you know um, any, any particular uh, issue with respect to what can come out or mm -hmm. what the organization can contribute. Mm -hmm. Can I talk a little bit to that while I'm here? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that's um, what I wanted to ask. The, oh, do you want to ask first? I just, because I have, earlier you stated that you had already put in money for consulting and yep. set up and plans. Identify how much money Mariah Mitchell's already mm -hmm. put into mm -hmm. this particular mm -hmm. project, because mm -hmm. that's, I think that's. Yeah, sort of yeah, we have already. Yeah, we the structural engineer, the assessment was done by the Mariah Mitchell Association on its dollar. All the assessments that we did for the library, for the Mitchell House in the past, with all the conservators and others, and having people come and going and doing testing was all paid for by the Mariah Mitchell Association. So we come to you after we have the assessments already completed by whomever is part of that. So we're paying for that. And it's roughly between eight and twelve thousand dollars, depending on the project. For the Mariah Mitchell Association, we have roughly seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year that we have for our um, preservation and repair budget, and that is for all of our buildings. Um, and so we are very keen in trying to raise funds um, to complete some of our projects. So currently we're working on, we have to replace the deck at Loins Observatory. So we had um, a, a board member who gave us a, 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 you know, a kind of a starter to use to go out to ask people for um, more money. So we are doing it. It's just certain projects we have to pick and choose which ones we feel will be more um, um, immediate. Yes, or, or sexy or, or what have you to get people. So right now we are in, under kind of a campaign already for loins to raise those funds. I have applied to other organizations for the observatory. Um, 
And this can be something that we can also ask for, but our focus has been on the loins deck because we want to make sure that people can stand on it without all falling down to the ground at the moment um, because we are leaking at, at, at Vestal Street, but the loins deck actually wound up being more of an immediate need. Mm -hmm. um, but our budget basically is covering things like everything from like the sprinklers being inspected to elevators to the alarms. So it's a very um, it's a it's a dance that I have to do with figuring out where to put money and where things have to go. Like you know, if a refrigerator breaks, we have to pay for that out of preservation and repair for our 28 interns in the summertime. So we are keenly aware of trying to find ways of fundraising. Um, and this summer we had. Um, besides our normal kind of fundraisers like our gala and the things for the Mariah's 200th birthday, um, the the deck has been our focus, which is going to be to the tune of um, probably um, twenty to forty thousand dollars. We also need to roboticize our that dome, um, and we're working on fundraising for that. So we have a lot of irons out in the fire. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to also not um, exhaust our our donor base, um, and as we all know, Nantucket is a small place, so everyone's constantly getting asked for money. So we're trying to find things that um, that we think we can raise money more quickly around. And this is one of the things we've talked about, but we wanted to come to the Community Preservation Committee first to see if that, you know, what you might support us doing. And that might also actually help us to kind of okay. rocket other people to give us money, particularly our former um, Observatory interns, our REU interns, might be willing to give much, but again, it's not going to be to the tune of twenties of thousands of dollars. Did you say roboticize? The roboticize dome? the What's dome. That? Yeah, <laughs> roboticizing the dome at the Loins Observatory means that if we roboticized it, you could make it spin from a computer from your computer. Right now, we can we can move the telescope from Vestal Street, where it's warmer, because it's not heated out at loins. But they have to go out and physically open the dome and rotate it. So as the, you know, as you're rotating, it moves. But the cool thing about roboticizing it is, is that we also are, um, can allow other people off islands, like school groups and colleges and universities, mm -hmm. to, to do time with us, to rent time, which would then actually help us to raise a little bit more money. And then they could literally, we could literally say, OK, you have two hours on this day from this you know, 2 AM until 4 AM that you can look at Mars, and they can sit at their computer in Hawaii and make the dome move and make the telescope move. I get chills. It's really cool. Um, so that's what we're aiming to do. And we're looking, we're actually talking right now to the National Science Foundation. National Science Foundation won't support the conservation of a historic, right, right, right. but they right. would Right. Potentially fund, the or, yeah. Again, it comes down to what's sexy, and repotization yeah. is far right. more sexy than grout. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. It's one quick question. Um, some of them have gone after the mass historic grants. Mm -hmm. so they've seen you know, anywhere from twenty-five to fifty thousand. Have you guys gone to them? Yes. One of our what, earlier ones got a fifty thousand. Yeah. Grant. What we did was we applied for mass um, cultural facilities fund grant. Uh, about three years ago, and that's allowed us to do two other buildings <laughs> um, to the tune of it's a one on one matching grant. So we matched 117,000 with their 117,000. And if you've gone up Vestal Street, it allowed us to re roof Hinchman, re roof the Astronomer's Cottage, paint outside in Hinchman, paint outside in Astronomer's Cottage. So it's not for lack that we're not. We're just trying to find the right pools of money that fit our needs. Um, and because those are technically housing, um, and they don't have preservation easements on them because they're multi-purpose buildings for us. That's why we went to Mass Cultural. So that's allowed us to do a lot of the work on Vestal Street. The last piece to that puzzle I'm working on right now is the basement of Hinchman being converted to an education center, for which I have about $11,000 left of the matching funds. And we just redid the floor and we're putting up a wall So um, for an office space. So we are. It, it, there's a lot of buildings at the Mariah Mitchell Association. and. 95% of them are um, 19th century or earlier. So we're just trying to find the right pools of money that we can apply to. So we have. But Mass um, Historic may help with the rehab. They could, they them. could, yeah. Building we're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I suggest, because they're beginning to put a, more money down here mm -hmm. for more projects, mm -hmm. so it may be a good, a yeah. good place for you to go. And the Mass Cultural Facilities Fund, we're not allowed to apply until we finished. Mm -hmm. our, and we have until December to finish that pool. All right, awesome. Oops. Any other questions from any other commissioners? You uh, have October 18th as the date. Yep. Well. And you want a, can I just refresh? You sure. want the um, breakdown of what we could do as far as like phasing it. Right. Um, 
the bad debt, the fundraising expenses versus the fundraising event right. expenses. And did you want me? There was another thing, and I how much money you guys have put towards this? Oh, okay. How much? Yeah, ready. Put towards this ourselves. Do you want that to include an outline of the other organizations that you're getting funding from for other okay. projects? So that will help the commissioners who are not able to be here today. From other orgs for our other sites. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's a good, uh, good submission. Thank you. They're exhausting, but they're fun. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Are you going to take the uh, IV off the pillow? Yeah, that's a constant. <laughs> that's the right yeah. 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 Everyone was upset when I took it off. Yeah, it's such a part of the picture. We got pictures of it. We don't need to see it now because it's destroying the building. He does it every couple of every couple of months, and it's really hard to kill it. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Do that. Thank you. Thanks. See you later. Our new Parks and Rec representative, finally. <laughs> when do you head off? January? End of January. Mm. A long time. Mm -hmm. Oh, they'll be here next week. and I'm executive director at the Nantucket Athenaeum. And I'm here um, with an application. It's kind of a continuing application <clears throat> because I came several years before um, with a proposal to um, conserve a number of the paintings in the Athenaeum's collection. And uh, we all agreed it made sense perhaps to do it in several phases. So we've done two phases already, and I'm here with regards to the third phase. Um, <clears throat> just to review um, why I think it's important that we do this project, um, this art collection that the Athenaeum has um, is open to the public year-round, free access, um, for all ages. Secondly, I think it really does provide valuable insights uh, into the history of, of Nantucket, um, particularly this group of, of portraits that I'm going to talk about today. And I think in looking at the building as a whole, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and it is a historic icon, the building is itself, um, that's on the National Registry, and I think that the interior portraits and paintings really add to the historic integrity of the building itself and, and, the, historic, and the experience, the total experience inside the building. <clears throat> I'm 
uh, applying to CPC because we believe that the conservation of these paintings provides long-term preservation of valuable cultural and historic Nantucket resources for the community and the general public. So let me tell you a little bit more about the paintings. Um, first, to review the first two phases. The first phase had four paintings and we received CPC funding for that. The application was for FY18, and the work was completed in FY18. And that was for um, 17500 Then we came to you for phase two, which included ship's portraits. Um, we were approved, and the conservation work was completed in FY19 for a total of 19,800. I'm here with regards to phase three, which is for three portraits, asking for $18,000 for the following three portraits. The first one is Abram Corey. I hope you've all had a chance to see this wonderful portrait. It's on the first floor right when you come in. So if you're standing waiting to check out books, you can stand right next to Abram Corey. Um, Many of you may know he was the last man of Native American descent on Nantucket. His mother was a Wampanoag. And he's depicted in the portrait sitting in his house, appropriately at Abrams Point. Um, and he died in that house at age 82. The portrait to me is particularly um, poignant. I think if you see his face, it is a man of character and a man of standing, but it is a very sad face. Um, the, but at the other, on the other hand, there's this wonderful backstory about that portrait. Um, it, the artist was a woman who came from Prussia, and she had a studio in New York. And it, it's one of the few art pieces we have done by a woman, so I think that's significant as well. But she came to Nantucket to visit. She was told about Abram Quarry, and she decided to paint his portrait. So she met him briefly. They arranged on a time. She said she'd love to um, paint his portrait at his home. So she arrived the day with all of her paints, and she was very dismayed to see that he was very dressed up. He'd gotten his best clothes out, because this was his portrait. This is the way he wanted to be remembered. She, on the other hand, thought he was going to be there in Native American costume. I don't know what she thought that was going to be, but I gather they had quite a quarrel um, about it. In the end, they compromised. He would wear the outfit that he dressed in that morning, but he took off his shoes. <laughs> so in the portrait, the shoes are underneath the chair, um, and he is in bare feet. Um, and he's there with a number of the baskets that he was white, quite well known for, for um, doing. So it's a lovely, lovely portrait, because it has a story involved in it. Um, but it also is very important from a historic standpoint. Um, the painting itself is fair in fairly stable condition, but there has been some abrasions, particularly in the shadowed areas of the portrait. So the conservation work will mainly co concentrate on those areas of the painting. Um, the second painting is upstairs in the Great Hall. It sits over the reference desk. It is a portrait of Frederick Coleman Sanford. Um, just some background about Frederick. He was born on Nantucket. He was a whaleman. He went out fairly early on on some whale ships. I don't know whether he was seasick or whether he was just a canny business lad because he came home and said, enough of the whale ships. I'm headed for California. And he became a um, merchant, an agent for a merchant firm out there that did a lot of work in the China trade. 
So he um, himself went back and forth to China, but he also lived in San Francisco for many years and built up a sizable fortune. He came back to Nantucket with his fortune in hand, including some lovely artwork, which he gave to the Athenaeum in his estate, and also all the books that are behind that desk, that line that wall, are his personal book collection, which he also left to the Athenaeum. The, he became eventually the president of the Pacific National Bank, as well as the president of the board at the Athenaeum. The artist is as well known, if not better known, than, than Sanford, at least in the outside world. The artist is Eastman Johnson, and he um, came to Nantucket with his family in 1870, fell in love with Nantucket the way so many of us have, bought a piece of property, and came back and started doing some wonderful, wonderful painting over the years. We're lucky enough to have two Eastman Johnsons. One of them is this portrait of Sanford. Um, so we are proposing to have it conserved. It um, is has a lot of surface grime on it, so that will have to be removed. Um, There'll be some losses to the colors, which we already know we can see um, are happening. So those will be retouched. And then there'll be a final varnish, light varnish, um, to integrate the retouching and to preserve the quality of the painting. And there'll be a new backing board put on the painting as well. The third painting is also an Eastman Johnson. and. Um, and is hangs over the door into the vault in the corner of the room. And it is a portrait of a man called John called Dalton. We discovered that it had had the wrong person as the person being portrayed a number of years ago. I don't know how that happened, but we did a lot more research and discovered it was Mr. Dalton. He was born in Chelmsford, Mass. in 1825, and he died in New York City in 1889. Graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Medical School, and he became one of the foremost American physiologists. And he was actually the first full-time professor of physiology in the United States. So he was a, man, a significant man of science, um, made wonderful contributions to this country. Um, Eastman Johnson painted his portrait. We're not quite sure the circumstances under which he painted it, but it could quite possibly be here on Nantucket, but we don't have all of those details. Um, we continue to search for them. It's in a similar condition to the Sanford portrait. Um, it needs, um, the varnish needs to be removed, the surface grime needs to be removed. There's some retouching of the painting, that, the paint itself, um, and then there'll be this light final varnish to protect it, a new backing board for the painting itself. So those are the three paintings that we're talking about this year. Um, the total uh, application is for $18,000. Um, we truly believe that the conservation of these portraits is important because they represent very valuable, both historic and cultural resources for the island. Um, and I think it truly will enhance public understanding of, of our treasured history. Question. Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've done a great job so far. Those ship portraits are beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, my only, it's just a, throwing it out there. The Headwind House is now being open to the public again. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why Dalton's painting is going before William Hadwin's painting, just from an historical point of view? It's, that's a good question. Um, they're up next. The, the next three are up next. Um, they're very large. And so we're kind of sending them a little bit by grouping by size. So these three are somewhat similar size. Yeah. and. 
Patricia, um, who does our conservation work, that's what her studio can handle this yeah, go around. Time. But next year, um, he's on his way. Because <laughs> that one of Sanford is dark. Yes, it is, and, and it's particularly hard when it's it up, up, so, it up far. so far. So I really can't wait for him to come home. I love that picture of Andrew's uh, corner. Yeah. yeah, to me that's one of the treasures, probably my favorite. I, I don't let Rye Mitchell on the left know that so much, but Abram is my, my favorite portrait. <laughs> Other questions? Um, so... Um, as I'm sure you're aware, we've got uh, severe constraints on you know this year's what appears to be what we've got available, mm -hmm. and um, so I, of course, like everybody else, I use the library all the time. Love oh, those pictures. Thank you. Thank but you do have an endowment of over twelve million dollars, and so. Mm -hmm. I guess my question would be, if um, if we were unable to grant you the money this year, would you proceed anyway, or would you hold off? I think we'd probably have to hold off, because that endowment is um, really, um, much of it is to support the taking care of the building itself, which um, I'm sure you can imagine. Well, we've got the painters there, so you probably have seen just in this last week that um, painting the exterior of that building is a significant project every year, and we try, we're on a regular rotation basis, so we try to do two facades and keep going. Um, so that we never fall behind in terms of taking care of that building. Overall, uh, taking care of the building, um, also including the infrastructure, um, and also what it takes just to run the building, is about a quarter of a million dollars every year of our budget. So for me, that endowment, much of that endowment, is underwriting the, the care. And it, a portion of it, when we did a campaign, was specifically for that. So it is restricted, to, for the most part, to taking care of the building. We had to um, rehab the windows a couple of years ago. That exactly. Was extremely the, expensive. Yeah, we put those in storm windows too. We had custom made storm windows to make sure it was all buttoned up and yeah, tight. Yeah, the building. And, yeah, the, yeah, done a lot of work to make it very sustainable, but it always is costing us. It continues to do yeah, that. The pain just doesn't want to stick to that building. Well, well, it's partly because the change in because of the change from the environmental standpoint right. of the kind yeah. of paints we can paint use, paint. it just doesn't linger, which is the good thing, because if it falls to the ground, it's not going to linger in the air or in the soil. But um, yeah, it's a constant, constant battle, particularly that south-facing side, yeah. which gets um, all the elements and it bakes away. Yeah. We, we paid for all the, the lead paint or whatever it was to come off the Methodist in Church columns. Oh, so I'm sure. That was a massive production. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, we often ask, and, and Anthony has done that, to kind of share the costs. You're going to pay for the... Oh, on an individual? Um, or? The, um, the frames and, and the fact that you've got the, the proper heating and air conditioning yes. to, to preserve those paintings. So you're, and um, I don't know if, if anybody wants how much you've laid out for the frames and they could do the transportation. I don't know if that would help people to... See yeah. how you've contributed to um, what you're asking. Just sort of be more specific about what that's costing. Um, every if the frames will depend when um, they get down there because uh, Patricia Garland only handles the paintings. We have another conservation person in New Haven who um, comes over and looks at the conditions of the frames and then sends me an estimate of what she's proposing to do for the frames. Um, to me, it's of equal importance, quite honestly, because those frames are 19th century frames, and if you look to see what it would cost to either um, completely switch them out with new frames, um, they're very expensive. 
Um, it can range from so far from three thousand to five thousand dollars a frame, depending on the condition and how much gold uh, leaf has to be reapplied. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like a plaster underneath. Um, that's how they achieve all those curly cues. And it, I thought originally it was wood underneath, but in many cases it's more like a plaster, and that can crumble. Um, and so she has to build up the surface again before she puts the gold leaf on. So, thank um, you. Yes. Mm, I think that's it for me. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Any additional information that we need back from Molly? No, you've done a great stewardship. Okay. Great oh. stewardship with that building it's and that a privilege. stuff in there. It's a privilege. And we told you before, you better never retire. <laughs> okay. I'll let my board know. <laughs> well, thank Thanks. you so very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Less money than usual. Sorry, it's good enough. Why is it you have less money than usual? Oh, sorry. I, I, um, actually, we, we, based on the discussion with Brian, we may be about the same as next year, but the reason that we'll have less is because of state match. Uh, the, uh, in the last uh, two years, Boston and one other major community have gone on to the CPC. I discovered that there's funding around. And so the legislature means that the pot of money that's available is now taken up by another major, major community uh, because the total pot is split among all the different communities. And it's split on the basis of the three levels that uh, the communities have opted for the uh, amount of the surcharge. So uh, everybody gets the first tranche that's divided by out, and then we get the second and third tranches because we elected um, many, many years ago, 15 years ago, to have a 3% surcharge. Uh, in the beginning, early years, Jack, we had 100% match from the state with respect to everything. So we've, we've received uh, somewhere north of $13 million between 13 and 15 from the state, uh, from the so state. Did the whole thing on there or just the morning? The no, city. God almighty, no, it's not crazy. <laughs> but in the last couple of years, it's, 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 it's gone down, down uh, and then last year it was... Because once I get out of here, I'm going to go... Two years ago, it's like I'm going to bring back home for a few minutes. We think that it might be a little bit of a percent. Yeah. 
town meeting tonight. Right. So that, that, that's, that's tonight. That's tonight. Man, my brain's dead. Uh, no, I've had that on my calendar. You know what? Without Monday holiday, it gets me all goofed up. I think I can do an easy dinner for the North Beach Monday before you go. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. You'll be eating at ten o'clock. Right. Yeah. And it's six o'clock. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So our funding needs went from about three hundred thousand, three hundred thirty thousand dollars a year to about six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, we accomplished this in two thousand. Uh, 18, 17, 18, finishing in April, we finished two homes uh, in St. Vincent's Path. Uh, got two families in, and uh, they're very happy there, and the homes are beautiful. And uh, now we start building on a three way drive. Three way is next to our old building on Tacoma uh, Way, behind the fire station at New York. Yes, 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 yes <laughs> correct. <laughs> and hopefully, we're it's orderly. Um, and uh, we're building that's been, we started that in, um, I guess, August. We started framing. It's now weather tight. The windows are in. The basement was poured yesterday. Uh, and the electricians and everyone are hard at work right now. So moving along, spending money uh, between yourselves and the chip grant, we will exhaust most of the funds. Uh, we'll run through the numbers if you want. John can later. Uh, we now have petitioned the town, which I think a few of you have seen the plans that we've petitioned for, uh, lot 88, 89, and 90, where we were going to build one home, two homes on, uh, on the next two, and then one, and one home uh, on the last lot. Uh, the town's been a little slow, the select board, we, uh, we have support from uh, Andrew Voris and support from uh, Tucker Holland on this. The, we've met with uh, many of the select board members. They're supportive of our efforts, but with a lot going on between uh, the uh, six fairgrounds and um, tipping point. Uh, I think they want to be a little cautious about giving away land at the moment. That's so uh, we hope something will come of that. We've, put, we've applied for three weight to be put on the shy list that uh, will be signed by the select board uh, tomorrow evening or to this evening, we hope, and that application got off. Um, so the prerequisite from some of the board members was that we get on the shot list. So that's a pretty complicated process, but we're getting there and at least we'll, the application will be in and we'll see how we stand. Because of the delay, we've decided now we've um, had the architect look at the site. Instead of being one house on uh, the current lot, uh, we're going to put a second house on that lot so we can start building hopefully before, get the hole in the ground before Christmas. Um, and we'll put two families on that lot, and then if we get the others, it'll be one, one, and two. Try to keep it orderly. Uh, it does fit. It's a little bit smaller. It's going to be two bedrooms, uh, and it's probably about a thousand square feet, a little over a thousand square feet. This new home that we've designed with T.J. Watterson, and um, so they'll keep us moving while the town gets through the issues that they have. Uh, we just have want to keep working. We have two, besides the family for three way. We have two other families already picked. Um, and they are anxious to help, and they've been working on the other projects with us to give us to have to do 350 hours sweat equity. So they've been very supportive, and we want to get them in and then just keep going. So we proved that we can we can up our uh, building to two homes in a year, thanks to yourselves and others, and we really just want to keep going. And we hope this is a solution. What's the problem with the shy list? Is it, is it your selection process for the family? There's a couple things. Um, yeah, the, no the, the selection. Please. The selection process, uh, they say that you have to have a, a lottery, independent lottery agent, which we, we did not. Mm -hmm. They said it should be off island, you, you should be advertising off island. We did advertise in the Inky online, so we showed them a copy of that. We're gonna find out from that, it's sort of a floating target because what they're not giving us credit for, on the shy list, there's an administrator that we're speaking to there. They keep saying it has to be less than 30% of this, their spending. Ours are about 20% of the spending because we have a 0% 30-year mortgage that we give them. We, there's no, we don't need any mortgage insurance and there's no down payment. So this saves them over the life of the loan. They're not calculating over $200,000 of the life alone. So we're already meeting the criteria of less than 20, around 20% of their spending. So they're, they're, they're spending about $1,100 a month, including local taxes. Um, so we hope that we get there and they will say, all right, this is a much better deal for the homeowner than it is in the Cape, et cetera. But we won't know until they come back to us. So but we think one stumbling block will be that. We don't, we think we'll be able to get through it once we have a conversation with them. Uh, but in terms of, we're happy to change after we get these people in, to so happy to change on the other list to go to a lottery agent, to go to, uh, you know, advertising in, in, on the Cape. But you know, this is this going to that would hopefully get by the regulations. But reality is, you have to put in 350 hours of sweat equity here. 
So that's very difficult for some living off island to accept it. But we were happy to interview them and be part of our, we had 28 people apply for each of these last homes. Um, and we'll see what happens. Yes, Linda. Do you have anything else that you want to cover? In your... No, I'll take questions. Linda. Um, a couple of things that are holding you up, and not just you to advertise in the central register, which is what we have to do when we do regular lotteries, and there's no covenant on it, local covenant for 80 percent in perpetuity or less type of thing. So there's okay. a, no, that's not true. They, they, the the have houses all have deed, they have a deed restriction that yeah. that it makes them that are they're 80 percent or under in perpetuity. But they're not the DHCD. It's, it's not writer. what was approved here. So that's what I'm saying. There's a, there's some technical issues with it because we've asked to have you guys put on the shy mm -hmm. list since you guys started, and then you just have been resistant to it, because it's a totally different it's a totally different program. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised to hear you say Lot 90. Lot 90 was promised to the Housing Trust to move structures onto it. Is that something that we're unaware of? No. I, I, well, I, I think that's true. It was, it, but what we've been told by Andrew is that was a, ha a lot to be used for um, moving to a, 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 a affordable housing trust fund, yeah. and I think, again, I don't didn't need to start a word here, but it was our impression that that was not going to happen, and that therefore, lot was available for us to develop on. We're if, got, it's, if if you have plans for it, yeah. Then, so yeah. I would have that conversation with the trust before you keep going with lot ninety, because okay, we well, had two houses that I've got somebody wants to give us. So I just just okay. So, so if that's true, that's a ways off. We've actually, because of the delay, and I understand they didn't want to go out to three, uh, give us the three lots. We've, in the last letter to the select board, we've asked just for lot 88, mm -hmm. so that we can actually, we just need to keep moving. Keep moving. And we want, to, we want to get these homeowners in their homes. It'll solve the past problems with the shy list. We can actually start you know, doing a lot of raging, do everything they're gonna tell us we need to do because it's, we, it's in our best interest to get this on the show list as well. Now the 280 and change, um, is that going to the second unit on weight drive? The, uh, or is that going to fit, the, the one unit on weight drive has already been funded basically, isn't it? No, we're gonna use the, John, you want to run through the numbers? Yes, yeah, so we, we need another 140,000 for that. Yeah. At least so, we spent 140,000, we need another 190. Okay, because so, you got 150 from the trust. Should, yeah, we're trying just, to get that out. Yeah, we're trying to get that out, but we haven't used that yet. So we're, we're, the current funds we have sitting on, we have chip money left, and we have uh, Our your money coming. Those when we complete four-way drive between chip and uh, CPC funds, we'll have eighty-seven thousand, ninety thousand dollars left. Mm -hmm. That would then we'll start put that towards 3B, if this is the new plan, okay. which we can easily do, put it towards 3B, plus we've applied for, you know, then we'd use the 150,000 for uh, the, if we get the affordable housing trust fund money to us, we will use, uh, if we get a chip grant, we'll see, we'll and if we month. get this grant, we'll know in a month. So and then the, what we would do is mid next year, we would then, if either on uh, lot 88, if we if they're given us the that time, we'd like to start digging there by you know by May or June. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep things moving. If it, that's if, where the two eighty would go, would be to lot eighty eight, potentially three B. Three B. Yeah, three B, which is the second house and the first lot plus right. the, the other house. Okay. So a combination of both funds, which we'll need. And we if we end up doing this, you know, getting these, we'll, exhaust, we'll come close to exhausting the funds. The, the only thing is, is that we've said this to everybody who's come in is that we have five thousand five million dollars and we have less money this year than we've ever had mm -hmm. since the inception. If could you give us a priority list? I see the total, but could you give us what do you absolutely have to have to keep going on what's already planned as opposed to what's may happen if the selectmen cooperate or not cooperate sure. in a timely fashion because we may be only give you may be able to give you nothing but we may be able to only give you something to finish right now looking at we're going to need that in a narrative so we got a call so the chip people feel the same way is that there is much more demand for those that funding they we, we requested 150 from them last year we got 175 my guess is we're going to get somewhere around 100 to 125. There are just too many demands, not okay. just for the housing sector, for other sectors, and they're short. 
Mm -hmm. um, my guess is that if we have two hundred thousand dollars, I think we requested two fifty here. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Fifty. Two hundred thousand dollars. Because if we have the full two fifty, we're not two hundred thousand dollars plus. We're going to get the others. Will leave us. We can. We'll dip into if we get going on the other house next year as well. We'll dip in. We'll be short by about fifty grand of our monies. We will be short. Um, Two thirty-three. Is that the bare minimum you could get from us? Is two hundred? I mean, if we can give you a hundred, that gives you still going forward. You go back to the trust. Is that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, there are. You're dealing with an unknown. If you, you know, keep agreeing that if we were two fifty to two hundred, we can definitely keep going. I know that chips going to be less and affordable. We haven't spent any of that yet, but I don't know where they're going to be with that. So you know, you have a couple of hats on, but personally, it would be around the 200 number would keep us flush and we're able to. I'd love to have get three people in three people in these homes by June next year. It's very, very, very possible. <coughs> with the not with anything, else, not with nothing else happening. Very okay. Yeah. So not to put you on the spot, yeah, point, sure. that doesn't need an answer today. Okay. I would really like you to walk away from this. Mm -hmm. We do need answers by October 18th, though, mm -hmm. the form of a letter, which would be great. Okay. But I hear you working hard at it, and I don't want to put you on that spot today. I yep. would rather have you have a really We'll show you the math. We'll give, we'll give an updated. Yeah, story. no, no, no. Take, but I want you to take your time and really just Think kind of out. hash that out over the next few days before okay. we have to get down into, into that breakdown sure. of what we can and can't do as well. Um, great. Certainly scaling it as well, too, would be good because maybe there's a benchmark in there somewhere we can hit. So, you know, low level, medium level, high level, however you want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I just respectfully want to give you some time to do it the right Great. way. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, thank you. But we do need it by October 18. And can we email Glenna? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. So, so basically, you would just make sure we're in is if you want to understand. The remaining expenditures on three-way drive, the one that's under construction now, the cost of 3B, the current plan to build a second house on that lot, and then well, I, 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 think, I think we probably I think we want what, what we're saying here is we'd like to add in the cost for lot 88. Yeah, but being optimistic that that's that well, well, basically, Joe, yeah. what we're looking for is you're asking us for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, mm -hmm. what we need to know is. What's it going to be used for? Okay. Uh, what's the specifics in terms of your timeline, in terms of the project, and what's it going to be able to achieve? Uh, because that's a determination in terms of if it's something down the road it's for you to have nice funds so that if you get another lot from the town, you ain't going to get it. <laughs> but if there's a clear um, delineation of exactly what what you're doing, you have the land in place, you have the plans in place, you have the strategy in place. That's what we want to hear from you okay. in terms of and of that 250, what do you absolutely need to have in order to make that happen? Yes, okay. put 88 out so that every one of them has their own cost. Okay, okay, we do that. And another thing, just to where we've done, whether it's uh, through Beth Ann Main, who's the vice president of the board, we've gone to uh, Jamie Feeney, at, who's the tipping point, who's doing the um, South Shore development. Feely, mm -hmm. yeah. Feely. Uh, whether he would consider, since it went well for us, we're working with Hack at uh, Sachem's, mm -hmm. if he needs a bargaining chip, would he consider doing something with us mm -hmm. um, to help? So we're trying different avenues to get land. Sure. It worked well with Hack, or, and it worked well with uh, Scanlon, so we'll see if we can see. If, he, if he's looking for bargaining chip, he responded, he'll keep it in mind. Cool. Any other questions from? Just, just a comment. It was very helpful for us to go um, and see the houses and meet the families. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've always been a supporter of Habitat, but it, it, it just gives you a different glimpse. And the, I was blown away by the lovely uh, details construction and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was, you're doing a phenomenal job. And, you know, whatever we, we do the best we can, giving you what we yep. can. So thank you for that. Kind we of appreciate work. it. Yeah. And, and, we certainly, and we certainly understand that your funds are constrained these days, as are the other grantors we've spoken to. So we, I think we can come back and you know give you a model of what we think the 
bare bones, if you will. And I it. would like to see some clarity with respect to the funds being used, ending up with properties on the shy list, because that's the, I mean, we, we, your funding is restricted to 80% of, of median, uh, and so that should qualify for the shy list. I was surprised that the habitat hounds aren't on the shy list, and so with respect to a, how the funding that we'd be giving now would be guaranteed to be on the shy list, and what steps in somewhat more detail than we discussed would be, are being taken to try and get the existing habitat houses on the shy list would be very strong help to us in terms of directing the funding relative to meet the issues that the town is facing relative to uh, meeting the state guidelines. Okay. Do, as with the covenant, we had to go for a legislative action. Does DHCD have the capacity to allow this on the shy list or not, or do they have to go to a higher power? I believe the DHCD decided it. So we've been in contact with Rico at the DHCD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've pre-approved three of our former habitat homes, our nice. first three. We still have to do the application process, but Tucker has said three-way drive was a higher priority than the older homes because to get into Safe Harbor, it's only on new construction, not existing homes. And so we put that kind of on our back burner while we were trying to get three weight on the shy list. The biggest problem from the DHCD has been their pricing model versus our pricing model. Right. So mm -hmm. we've done a lot of research in the last two to three weeks, talking to other Habitat affiliates in Massachusetts. And some of them have gone against Habitat International's regulations to get on the shy list, which then takes away our funding sources from Habitat International. Right. That was the so worry. It's hard to say which one should we follow, and if Nantucket is saying we have to do the shy list, and perhaps that's something that we try to follow, but you don't want to lose your designation with Habitat International as right. well. Right, mm -hmm. because they're basically the ones that hold all the cards, Habitat International. So it's, it's a tough, tough line to yeah. follow. Yeah. Well, um, excuse my ignorance, but what would happen if you lost your affiliation with Habitat International. I mean, the fact that you're even considering it means that... There's ways to petition. So what um, Cape Cod has done is they completely follow the DHCD, and every year they have to petition Habitat International to allow them with each new house. Mm -hmm. So it's, they have the staff to do that, and I think that's something that we have to consider is do we have the staff to keep petitioning every single time we build a new house to allow us to stay in standing with Habitat International. Okay. We've had a couple of conversations at our at our board meetings about, you know, because there are some limitations of being part of Habitat International. We have, right. to, we have to tithe to the to the international, which some of us don't feel is we're getting a heck of a lot of value for. But I think that generally we've come back and said, you know, the, the sort of the brand, the Habitat brand, right. is positive. I think it resonates with certainly our retail donor base, people that you know that uh, participate in the, in the annual appeal. Um, don't they and people sort of identify, you know, when you say you were Habitat International or Habitat Nantucket, people kind of identify and understand what we're, what we're all about. Um, but, you know, we've, we've sort of said, you know, is there, if we just became, you know, Nantucket affordable housing developers or something, what would we lose? And so far, I think we feel like the value in the brand is there. And, uh, sure. So don't try. they hold the mortgages or don't they, how do they, they're involved we with do. the financing of these things, right? No, we don't. You're yeah. involved with the financing. No, I'm talking well. about their zero interest and in all the other stuff. Doesn't that come down from them, that okay. type of program? Well, the, that's that's the, the policy. Yeah. That, it's a, that it's a 0% mortgage, no down payment, 350 hours of sweat equity. That's the policy from Habitat International. The funding and is all really from all of our donors. I mean, uh, they're all held here. Mm -hmm. So, thanks to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Info is due so. by the 18th of October, but earlier this day. Right? Yeah, well, we'll get it shortly. Thank you very much. For Thank you all very much for your time. They are on that 150 in the office. Okay. I, I, I went back and looked through some of the minutes. It was it was in the original meeting minutes. Oh yeah, we have got the minutes. We just have to. I'm going to get the minutes. Do that. I didn't see how many minutes. Well, I'm going to do that. Thank you. I love you too, and I. <laughs>
Oh. Happily assist. Okay, our next meeting is this Friday. Friday. This Friday, 30. 9.30. Start times are important. Yes. Yes, punctuality. Um, oh. I'm not here, I'm not here Monday. We have... Just two. It is Friday anyway. Open space. Okay. Are they the last on the list? No. No, 15. It's, it's our last nice. year. Yeah. I'm not here. I'm off island on Monday. Okay. Um, just an update, Barry. Go ahead. I'll let you. I just want to chime in at some stage, so go ahead, please. Um, just an update. Uh, in discussions with Brian, I don't have the rest of the numbers from him, but it looks like we're going to be a little bit better than I originally thought. Okay. It looks like the CPC surcharge is going to be about 2-2. Two, two. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a reflection of the uh, reassessment uh, of, uh, of properties uh, in the last uh, year or so. Uh, so, it, it, my guess is that we're probably going to have around the same amount of money we had last year. But depending on um, the, because of the nature of grants, we may in fact be able to um, award a little bit more because of the fact that we have the reserves in open space. Uh, and two of the bigger uh, requests are in the open space category. So, uh, but uh, Brian's promised to get me the, the, the numbers. Uh, as soon as you get some information from the state. So, yeah, so that actually raises a whole other point. Um, when you talk to Brian as well, too, uh, you probably had this conversation, but let's see if there's a way that we can spin those bonds down further. We've been talking about that all along. But Perfect. In fact, he, 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 has, he, he has never, he's never put in either of them out as bonds. And so he's been able to yeah. reduce them down significantly. You've mentioned. Because, we, because we've been paying more than the, we would have had to pay. Uh, you know, 125000 a year on first bond is more than covering the cost of it. So um, uh, that, it's one of the things I've asked him to find out what the status is of, of those. Um, but uh, um, uh, again, the original 10-year time frame uh, is probably reduced to maybe as, as, as little as eight years. That's great. Uh, because of, of, of what he's done in terms of not putting them out of bonds. How we, how the we only reason I bring that up is because the future doesn't bode well. No, again, exactly. so this Remember, we, we, were not very, we were not very comfortable with bonding, and we did it. Right. We were forced into bonding because no. of the two events that came up. Sure. Um, and, I, and I understand, I appreciate what we've done. I'm not saying the you know, past was incorrect, but I'm, I'm looking more toward the future and be able to access funding for these projects that come in. So when we're kind of in, even though we're not in the greatest state, if we're doing okay, that might be a time to start looking at this. If it goes down to seven years, six years, that's that's even better for us. Yeah. So it's it's just it's robbing Peter to pay Paul essentially. Um, the other thing I, I would really love to see if we can get our hands on it is for these current projects that are before us. If the organization has outstanding balances sitting in their funding, it's, it hasn't failed me that some of these organizations like to retain past funds because they think, oh, there's that piggy bank that I can tap into. But what they're also doing now at this point is holding us back from being able to fund the projects. By right, they, they, by right, there should come a stage of closure to these things. Well, and the problem is, is that, that use it for I know. Approve. The, way, we, the way it's structured is that as long as they do start something within two years of the award, then there's no time limit with respect to Finishing. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that, that we've started to put pressure on them. Good. Uh, and so, because with respect to each year, we do we generally do two warrants. One with respect to the allocation of funds, and then se second with re respect to the return of funds. Yeah. Um, and so, as we get uh, a little bit further into uh, after we um, finish the hearings, I will start that again, calling the, uh, the various organizations that have outstanding balances to see about which what we can get back. But well, it would be very helpful to me if we actually had a, a breakdown of what is outstanding. You know, we, before this. You know, we, we do that, and, and, and 
as soon as Kathy gets back, I think we can have that. So, yeah, that if they have money left over from the project they're doing, they can only spend that money on that project. That's right. right. And, and, and then we take it back every year in a different warrant article yeah. if there's anything left. But I, I am concerned that, like I said, you know, I understand. Implicitly, it's dedicated toward that project and that project alone. They can't be transferred over. But I've also looked at some of these organizations hanging on to that same fund now for seven, eight years out. <laughs> and we all the end and back. Have we? It's honestly worth that look at because yeah. it's time, I yeah. think as we're getting deeper and deeper yeah. into this with less funding, it's time to start getting real serious about it. So I just like to have the numbers before me. Yeah, yeah, totally. And well, we've had that, that should just be an easy runoff of units to do that. So, but it really may influence my decision about where we're at mm -hmm. with some of these things. Okay, good. That would be helpful. And, and we can ask that question too. I mean, that's one to, to the, you know, how much money have you got left over from the last project? Oh, and I know like sustainable's done, but, but I have some questions about other ones. That, have you used all the money for the grant? Yeah. Where are you at? Well, Glenna usually tracks that, and that's the generator of the warrant article we put in every single year to yeah. take the money back. But we're also, as project managers, supposed to check to see, you know, periodically if there's money left that they haven't used. Yeah, we do that every year. Yeah, we do that every year, but, but I hear your point. You want to see it earlier, sooner rather than right. later. And that's where it Thank, Thank you. Man. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, Jack, um, I didn't formally say it at the beginning, but welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We're, we're delighted that, that you're here. We're delighted that you have the experience with Park Rec uh, forever. Uh, I think we will find that uh, this committee has a very, very big place in their heart for Park and Rec and, and a real concern with respect to what happened with respect to Park and Rec. Yeah, because it's a really important part of this community. Uh, I don't know what's with the town manager. The town manager doesn't feel the same. Yeah. Well, we want, to, we want to put it back. There's a big movement to put it back. Yeah. And I so just we'll support to, that. And I just want to acknowledge one other thing. Jack brings a wealth of experience uh. for everything he's done and the boards he's done as well, too. So it's not just parking. No, no, I understand. Yeah, no, I, I, just, I just didn't. I wanted to get that out because that's such an important thing. And, you know, that that we really draw upon a lot in this yeah. committee well beyond just the, the, the focus of what we're looking at from our own respective areas. So that, that, I'm thrilled to have you here. Yeah. And the other, the other thing, too, is to give you a sense of the process when we get around to decision making. Uh, on the first day, uh, we go through a, a, <coughs> which, which applications are in and out in terms of, of uh, uh, fitting within the guidelines. And then a first start at some allocation with respect to awards. Uh, and then we go to the second day, and it's as if the first day hadn't happened because if somebody has a change of heart or whatnot, they can say, well, I really think that that, that, uh, um, that this should be acted. So, so there's, and if somebody's not here, they couldn't make the hearing, so that doesn't mean that their voice is not heard. So until the very end, um, we, we are prepared to look at uh, what each of the commissioners feels is really important uh, in terms of the allocation that year. And the other thing that that, that uh, is that, that um, once we have made a decision, um, the decision is of the committee, uh, and it is not a decision that goes around and says, well, it was a 5-4 decision, or the fact is that I voted against it. But uh, So the, it's very important that, 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 we that, together, that, that, we work, that we work together because of the fact that, that we're responsible for making recommendations to the community with respect to that. And in the 14 or 15 years that Linda Barry and I have been on this committee, we have only had one award change. And that was for the snowmaking machine. <laughs> and Dead Horse Valley. The snowmaking machine at Dead Horse Valley. Right. So, so again, go down the fact of the matter is, is that, that, that um, basically what I'm saying is that, that um, I really appreciate that the members of this committee uh, put a lot of thought and time and effort into the decision-making process. 
and the community really generated work. Well, how many of us are on the committee? There are there are no, two of us today. Dawn is on the committee, on the committee okay. and Diane and, and Tim Sabrina. And Tim Sabrina. Three of us and Tim. Right. Yeah. Tim, well, who's the other one? Dawn Holt, Dawn Hill Hokey, right. and, and Diane Combs. Oh, Diane. From HTC. Right, Diane Combs. Yeah. Too, right. yeah. All right. Any other kind of motion to There's not a lot going on so, in January, February when you're not here. Right. <laughs> January, February, I won't be around. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.